You're still, still, uh, still getting scoops out there, Mike. What, what's your overall impression of what's happened here in New England? Because I, I, we've talked about this all day, all week, all off season. I am just massively underwhelmed with their reset and their staff and the people they're bringing in and their plan post Belichick. It doesn't feel like they had much of one other than Gerard Mayo. Right, and the plan was the plan. I thought it was so strange that the story emerged as. Gerard Mayo being a very viable candidate for the job. I think this was from NFL media. He is a very viable candidate because they have a contract already in place. It's like, well, wait a minute. Hang on. Hang on, Ian. If the contract's already in place, he's already got the job. He's not a candidate. You're going to have to write him a massive check to buy him out. You have promised him the job in advance to just even have a search that would include him and Mike Vrabel and anyone else. You've got to buy this guy out. So they made the decision that Mayo was the guy, and they reduced it to writing, and they were going to owe him, and I don't know what the number is, but it would have been something at least in the seven figures, maybe low eight figures, I don't know, but they would have owed him a lot of money if they didn't give him the job because there had been this presumption it was going to be Mayo, and at some point during the season, it felt like, is this so bad that they have to clean out everybody, that anyone with any connection to Belichick has to go, and it's going to be a hard reset, everyone out, and we're going to start from scratch. And they decided not to do it. And one of the business reasons surely is we've already made this commitment to Gerard Mayo. When you're listing the pros and cons, one of the cons of a hard reset is we got to pay this guy a bunch of money to not take the job that we've already promised to him. In addition to what they're probably paying Belichick this year. Now you're talking big money. That's a great question to get the answer to. They did a mutual parting that allowed him to go anywhere else he wanted to go unfettered. Did he give up? any of his buyout to make that happen that he, he would be have, a great question he didn't have to no i said that all along when like when we started talking about the possibility of a trade i said you know what why would he agree to anything right just say i'm here i'm working he was putting those signals out too in his press conference after the the season ended i'm here i'm working i'm getting ready for next season if you want me to do it i'll do it if you don't that's fine but either way i'm just doing my job my sense is he got I, he wouldn't have given that up. He shouldn't have given that up. I don't think he did. I think they're probably paying him off, which is why their current staff is so cheap, because they're factoring in Bill's money as well, which they tend to do there. What do you think happened with Belichick? How come he didn't get a job? I think that unless you're going to throw the keys to the entire car to Belichick and say drive it wherever you want, you've got these organizations with employees already in place who – are going to be concerned about what the contract says and what happens when he shows up. Okay, I'm going to go work for this team, and so and so is a GM. He's got final say over the draft. He's got final say over the roster. I just take whatever players he gives me, and I coach them up. And I'm fine with that. I agree to it. Okay, that's fine. But then for that guy, and this goes back to exactly what Robert Kraft said that Thursday when they announced the parting of ways. Well, did you consider Bill's willingness to take on less power well it wouldn't it wouldn't work it would be too confusing it would right. be too awkward i think that applies to any team his reputation will precede him he is bill belichick he is the greatest of all time he walks through the door and you know i'm the guy that i'm the 37 year old general manager and i'm like okay uh, uh, coach you uh, you work for me but you know i work for <laughs> you you know and when it's time to go over the draft all right fourth round there's this receiver from marshall that i like and belichick's just giving you that look it's like well maybe not him right, right? well i'm sorry maybe let's try somebody else so i just don't know how you make it work the right way when the the subordinate is so much better and experienced and older than the boss and i think that that like the i i had heard that arthur blank wanted to hire him in atlanta and you know palace intrigue rich mckay working some things because he he would have wanted mckay i don't know if he would have wanted him fired but he would have wanted him Out to have way. no fingerprints whatsoever in any way, shape, or form, directly or indirectly. I'm never talking to him. I'm never talking to anybody but Arthur Blank. That's the way I always did it. That's the way I'm always doing it. I don't want Rich McKay around. I don't want this person. I don't want this person. I don't want this person. Here's who I want. Here's how I want to do it. And I think Blank wanted to do it, but along the way, some way, somehow, Blank was convinced to stay the course. And maybe it was going to be that McKay was going to have to be so neutralized that it made Blank uncomfortable. Because I think a lot of these guys who are... You know, they, they they don't want to admit that they don't know things. 
so they have a Rich McKay to whisper in their ear to help them know the things that they don't want to admit to the world that they don't know, and they feel very exposed if they don't have a Rich McKay there to help them along. Do you think he'll coach again? You know, it's funny. He goes 0 for 7, and we're like, oh, he'll definitely get a job next year. It's like, wait a minute. He went 0 for 7 this year. We have no idea which job is going to be open. We have no idea which owners are going to want him. We have no idea whether or not somebody's going to be willing to throw him the keys to the car. What's he going to do between now and then to make himself more appealing to a fan base? I really do believe the, the letter on page A3 of the Sunday Globe was step one in strategically laying that foundation. It didn't come out until he knew all the other doors were shut. He could have done that letter the first Sunday after he walked or mutual parting or whatever. I think it's all part of you got to get a fan base excited, you got to get an owner excited, you got to get a media group excited. I mean, he needs to get involved in TV somewhere and he needs to be likable, he needs to be funny, he needs to be someone who makes people say, "Man, I He needs to be the guy that they always tell us he is when you get away from football because right. you hear it all the time. Right. You get away from football, oh, he's, oh, he's great. Guy. He's great. He's this, he's that. That's the guy he needs to be on a big platform all season long to get fans, media, and everyone in the building willing to bring in the old curmudgeon when he puts the cutoff sleeves back on and he goes back to scowling all the time, because that's what he'll do, but at least you get in the door by being somebody different for that year. Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk, joining us here. Before we let you go, I just got to hit one thing with you, because it's a, it's a core thing on our show. We, uh, we like to say, and I like to say, that I, I think our very existence as sports fans and sports media, the uh, us as follows of sports we are in a pitched battle uh, for the heart and soul of our sports with the analytic community that is taking over oh God. these sports now the the baseball people have already lost the analysts have completely taken over that sport that is a completely analytically driven sport from top to bottom teams are run by the analysts the game is played based on the numbers and it's over the baseball has lost that war in football, I feel it's being waged on a daily basis with the analysts trying to take over this sport like they have baseball, and we're in a pitch battle. And I feel you're on the right side of that war as we are. That but that means we're stupid. Yes, we how are did stupid. We even, how we're did stupid. you get your shoes on we're your stupid. feet today? We're stupid. How did you manage to buckle your belt? They can't lock. argue the math. And how did you walk from your hotel? How did you even manage to check in? How did you know where to even go? The you alpha. can't be functioning in society if you don't accept these fundamental mathematical truths, Michael. Don't you think that, that, that people will put it on Campbell, but don't you think it's the analysts driving those decisions there in Detroit? Well, I think that it used to be if you were a coach and you had a big decision to make. There was a conventional and an unconventional. And if you picked the unconventional and it didn't work, you knew you were gonna get killed for it. So they would always go conventional, because if conventional doesn't work, well, that was the smart way to go. Then came analytics, which turned unconventional into conventional. Flipped it over. And then you start doing this stuff, and your easy response is, well, why did you go for it on fourth and five from your own 27? Well, the analytics said we should. Well, and then you at least have an answer to the question other than, I don't know, I'm dumber than Barry Switzer. So, par I'm sorry, Barry Switzer catching a stray, but remember he went for it on fourth and one from his own 29 in a game between the Cowboys and the Eagles like in 94 or 95, and it was like, what the hell is this guy doing? <laughs> now, hey, it's just analytics and you're a genius. And I think what it's created, it's created this monster where now you have guys like Dan Campbell who say, regardless of the analytics, I'm just going to be aggressive. Because it seems like the analytics always point to being aggressive. The ESPN bug at the bottom of the Monday Night Football screen, anytime it comes up, does it ever say go. ESPN analytics say, don't go? Never. Never. It always says, go. I don't even think there is a don't go. I, it's amazing to me. So it's conducive to guys like Campbell saying, I'm going to be aggressive, I'm going to be aggressive. So now when he's aggressive, it doesn't matter about the analytics. You don't get criticized for it anymore. Well, the, you can do whatever you want. Well, it's amazing. behind it, too. And, 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 well, well, right, but it's created. I mean, we should like it as fans because the game's much more unpredictable now. But the whole analytics thing, because they'll always say, oh, we have a formula for that. Well, you, 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 I was talking to a coach about uh, an, an interaction he had with an owner of a different team about analytics because the owners get smitten with this because then they hire all these mathematicians mm -hmm. and PhDs and Ivy League and then they're they become part of the cabal that whispers yes. into the owner's ear yes. so the owner doesn't feel so stupid because the owners typically don't know a damn thing about football so the coach was talking to the owner and the owner was questioning well okay this game when it was fourth and three why'd you kick the field goal why didn't you go for it 
Well, why are you asking? Well, because the analytics under that circumstance, here it is. I've got it all figured out. This time of game, this down and distance, as it is, you should get you said you go for it. Well, here's what I didn't go for. Because the defensive end was not being blocked by my left tackle that day. That's why I didn't go for it. And I didn't get my quarterback killed in that spot because he couldn't stop him. So, you know, all of these other factors, when you talk about an 11-on-11 ballet with all these inner moving parts and all the other things that go into it, and momentum is real, right? You just feel it. You know whether, and you know, goal line, fourth and two, and it like say, go for it. Well, okay, what's your play call? Where's your call sheet? What, what plays do you have left for short yardage? Do you feel good about them? Have you already used two of them? Would you use another one again? Are you going to use this one? Those are all decisions that have to be made like that by the coach. So I think it has a place. But this idea that it drives these decisions is ridiculous. It doesn't drive. Good, experienced, situational football, game day coaches. Bill Belichick should have a job because he would have kicked the field goal up 24-10 on fourth and two from the 28, and the Lions would be in the Super Bowl. The analysts have, are taking over, and I think they've taken over in Detroit. The only reason he manages it that way, Mike, is because he knows he's not going to get blowback because the analysts upstairs say you're on firm ground analytically, and so he's not going to get fired for keep going on fourth down because the whole organization's behind him. I mean, I think it's beyond that, and I think they're in his ear. I, I, I keep saying this. He did kick the field goal at the end of the second quarter, Mike. Yeah. I think that was even analytically driven because there's an EPA equation there that if there's not enough time to – uh, to, for it to play out, you kick it at the end of the second quarter, for lack of a better They've term. got a statistic to I respond think the to everything. are making the call. Yeah. They've got a statistic that responds to everything, and the, and the pushback I get is, well, you, there's no guarantee this guy would have made a 45-year field goal. He hasn't made, you know, he's this, here's this statistic about this, and it, it's like, look, if you don't have a guy, in this day's NFL, if you don't have a guy that can make a 45-year field goal, you got a big problem. you got a kicker problem. Yeah. And and somebody said to me, well, may, maybe we'll, maybe Dan Campbell likes having a kicker problem so he can go for it more often. I mean, Aaron, that's next level, but uh, yeah, I uh, I agree with you completely. Football is far more complicated than anything that could ever be reduced to a mathematical formula. And I was a math guy once upon a time, right? So I understand you, there, anybody that's ever done anything competitive, there is a human element that is inherently quantitative that can never be turned into numbers. Thanks for coming by, Mike. As Great always, seeing you guys. Good to see you again. Right. We'll be uh, watching. Anyway. We'll be listening. All right.